At this volatile and uncertain moment in history, it is almost impossible to ignore the extent to which global leaders of all political stripes are guilty of diverting attention away from their own failings. Almost everywhere we look, headlines are dominated by examples of powerful individuals pointing the finger at others whilst desperately clinging to double standards. Japan is seldom far behind when it comes to adopting fashionable trends from abroad. But in this instance, it has an especially colorful history of demonizing certain groups by holding them to a standard that those in power could never hope to reach. As a way to serve and preserve the vested interests of deeply flawed elites, many of these historical prejudices still play a role in modern society. For students of language, the evidence is hard to miss. Akujo means a woman who is especially ugly in appearance, who has a thoroughly bad character, or is so irresistibly charming that she corrupts even the most strong and powerful men. In Japan, the three most popular global candidates for this title are Cleopatra, Marie Antoinette, and the Empress Dowager Shishi of China's Qing Dynasty. But closer to home, there are three women who are still considered to have been such jealous, selfish individuals that they had a catastrophic impact on society. At this point, we should make clear that there is no equivalent term in Japanese for especially heinous men. The most murderous and ruthlessly ambitious leader can confidently expect to be celebrated as a national hero. Go too far for the well-oiled PR machine to spin horrific deeds as valiant acts of strong leadership, and there is always the option to blame the pernicious influence of a bad mother, an outspoken wife, or a conniving mistress. This is the sole reason why Akujo exists in our language, for the very practical application of double standards. But who are these three irredeemably evil women from Japanese history? Let's explore the popular myths. At the end of the Heian period, around 1185, the dominant Minamoto clan was defeated in a battle by the rival Heike clan. Ironically, Heian means peace, but we won't let such trivial details get in the way of a good story. Minamoto no Yoritomo was exiled to the home of Ito Suketsuka, who served with the Heike clan in Izu. Bound by his honor as a samurai noble, Minamoto was effectively placed under house arrest. Izu is a peninsula region in modern Shizuoka that has become a popular destination for seaside holidays. In this picturesque environment, the blood-stained exile fell hopelessly in love with the daughter of the family, who soon became pregnant. When the truth became impossible to ignore, Sukechka was furious that the son of a defeated enemy had seduced his own daughter. A boy was born, but executed by his maternal grandfather before he had barely taken his first breath. Terrified, Minamoto begged a powerful local merchant, Tokimasa, for help. But it wasn't long before his daughter, Masako, was also targeted by the amorous Minamoto. In an effort to nip this romance in the bud, Tokimasa locked his daughter in a small dark shed. But during an especially heavy rainstorm, she escaped and ran to Minamoto. Masako was clever and persuaded her angry father that the rule of the Heike clan would soon end since a growing number of prominent samurai were increasingly expressing discontent and calling for the restoration of the Minamoto clan. Perhaps he was initially persuaded by the potential business opportunities this would offer and consented to a marriage. As predicted, the Heike clan rapidly weakened with the death of its dictatorial leader. Masaku's husband conquered the eastern provinces and located his headquarters in Kamakura, another popular seaside destination. Here the first shogunate was established and the so-called Kamakura era began. Unaware that her husband was having an affair with a beautiful woman by the name of Kame no Mai, Masako became pregnant with their second child in 1182. Despite hiding his mistress at the residence of his retainer, it didn't take long for his clever wife to work out that Minamoto was having an affair. In a jealous rage, she attacked and destroyed the retainer's house, forcing Kame no Mai to flee in fear. Furious that the customary right for high-status men to maintain concubines had been compromised, Minamoto dismissed the men who had conducted the raid on his wife's orders. In response, she exiled the retainer who had provided cover for her husband's affair. 
Six years later, yet another concubine gave birth to Minamoto's son. However, fearing Masako's jealousy, the mother had her son ordained as a monk at the age of seven. This established a public image of Masako as an intensely jealous woman, and she came to be regarded as a thoroughly evil figure who stood in the way of the shogun prospering. When Minamoto died suddenly, his eldest son Yorie succeeded him as governor. He sowed dissatisfaction amongst his retainers by stealing the concubines of his subordinates and spending his days idly playing kemari, a ball game popular with the aristocracy. When her eldest son fell ill, Masako and her father Tokimasa hatched a plan to divide Japan in two so that her younger son Sanetomo could establish his leadership credentials by ruling one half. However, Yorie's father-in-law, who at the time enjoyed considerably more power than Masako's family, exposed this apparent plot to his recovering son-in-law, who ordered the destruction of his mother's family. But Masako was quick to learn of her son's plan and invited her in-laws to a reconciliation party, where her father promptly killed them off. Just like Ito Suketsuka, her homicidal fury extended to her own grandson, Yorie's son, and heir. To avoid further damage to her family's grip on power, she had Yorie imprisoned at a temple in Izu, where he was subsequently poisoned by her family. After Yorie's death, her second son Sanetomo became shogun with her father acting as regent and wielding the real power. After her father married a young and charming second wife, they plotted to install their eldest daughter's husband as the next shogun. When Masako discovered this plot, her father and her mother-in-law were ordained and sent to Izu. Masako, who thus punished her own father and son successively, is thought to have been a very ruthless woman. However, this can also be attributed to her strong desire to somehow preserve the Kamakura shogunate that her womanizing husband had founded. Sanetomo's sudden death in 1219 meant that the direct bloodline of the Minamoto shogunate was severed. Grief-stricken, Masako tried to find someone who could preserve the family line. Ten-year-old Fujiwara no Yoritsune, a distant relative of the Minamoto clan from Kyoto, subsequently became the fourth shogun of the Kamakura era, with Masako acting as his guardian regent. Sensing an opportunity when the former emperor, Gotoba Joko, declared war on the shogunate in 1221, it was Masako who rallied the clan's frightened vassals and lifted the morale of the army with a famous, or rather infamous, speech. We owe a profound debt to my departed husband that is higher than the mountains and deeper than the sea. It is time to stand up in his name and defeat the imperial court that treats us like mere watchdogs. It is an indication of just how much she was respected as a leader that we have a record of her speech, since it was unheard of for the words of even the most prominent women to be recorded. But more than that, the respect she commanded led to a victory that determined Japan would be ruled continuously by a military dictatorship for another 600 years. At a time when the average lifespan seldom exceeded 50 years old, Masako died at the ripe old age of 64, having fallen ill almost exactly four years after defeating the violent threat to her husband's legacy. Her death was announced the following day, and she was widely mourned, not least by powerful members of the ruling elite. As wife of the first shogun, Minamoto no Yoritomo, and then as a non-shogun following his death, Masako was equal to the task of preserving an otherwise fragile grip on power. But in doing so, she committed the cardinal sin of being as ruthless and power-hungry as her male counterparts. History tells us that she was an unspeakably evil woman whose jealousy at her husband's affairs with concubines had left the family short of legitimate successes. In modern Japan, you're unlikely to find anyone who believes that assassinating close family members is acceptable behavior for men or women. And yet there is lingering expectation that wives will quietly ignore their husband's extramarital activities, 
even when they poke a sizable hole in the household finances. Masako's demonization, primarily for objecting to sexual infidelity, speaks volumes about the lingering disparities in contemporary Japanese attitudes to gender roles. Our next unspeakably evil threat to double standards is Hino Tomiko, who was born in Kyoto in 1440. The Hino clan were a high-ranking noble family with a long history. Since the time of the third shogun, it was established tradition that the supreme leader would marry a daughter of the Hino family. Following this custom, Tomiko married Ashikaga Yoshimasa, the eighth shogun, at the tender age of 16. The young shogun was often careless, granting high office to favorites on a whim, in particular Yoshimasa's nanny from a low-ranking family, Imamairi no Tsubone, held considerable power within the shogunate and exercised it largely for her own comfort and convenience. The distinct possibility that Tomiko would give birth to a son posed a tangible threat to the power of the three most self-serving appointees, who, thanks to Yoshimasa's abdication of responsibility, had enjoyed free reign to run the government. The immediate solution was to distract him with a beautiful consort. With the help of her great aunt, Yoshimasa's mother, Tomiko recognized the pernicious influence of the trio controlling both national and extramarital affairs. Four years into the marriage, Tomiko lost her son in childbirth, giving rise to rumors that the baby had been cursed by Imamairi no Tsubone. Despite protesting her innocence, Yoshimasa's wife and mother convinced him to exile his former nanny to a remote island. En route, Imamairi no Tsubone learned that Yoshimasa's mother believed she'd got off too lightly and had dispatched an assassin. As a result, she became the first woman to commit seppuku, or suicide by ritual disembowelment, as a way of protesting her innocence. This is because the original meaning of seppuku was to expose one's true heart, no easy task aboard a sailing ship. Whether or not Imamairi no Tsubone's fatal protest redeemed her reputation among her peers, it has clearly spared her the fate of being described as one of history's most evil women, despite her habitual, self-serving abuse of extraordinary power. Tomiko and her great aunt stepped into the power vacuum created by Yoshimasa's continuing disinterest in matters of state. Seeking solace from all the fuss that interrupted his life of leisure, Yoshimasa turned to his concubines. But like Masako before her, Tomiko was unhappy and had them thrown out of the castle. From this point on, she was vigilant against the potential for her weak husband to be influenced by his comfort women. Tomiko gave birth to four children. Since they were all girls, concern grew about the line of succession. Again, a familiar story. Yoshimasa elected to ask his brother, Yoshimi, to give up life as a monk, return to the secular world, and become his successor. But almost immediately after Yoshimi accepted, Tomiko gave birth to a boy that the couple named Yoshihisa. Tomiko's efforts to ensure that her newborn son became the next shogun opened up a fierce family feud that plunged Japan into a civil war that lasted for 11 years. Tomiko's very practical solution to tightening security and raising much needed revenue was the introduction of inland customs gates that enforced new transit taxes. This raised about 7 billion yen or $49 million, an astronomical sum at the time. With this, she defeated the enemies of her son's right to rule. Unfortunately, her ungrateful son increasingly distanced himself from Tomiko and then promptly died at the age of 25, a short time before his ineffectual father, which left the role of shogun up for grabs. Her husband's nephew, son of her Civil War opponent, snatched his opportunity while Tomiko was still grieving. Despite mounting a successful coup d'etat and installing her preferred nephew as the 11th shogun, three years into his reign, Tomiko was dead at the age of 57. 
Having married a shogun more interested in wabi, sabi, and loose women than politics, Tomiko became an astute negotiator and savvy manager of public finances, in stark contrast to her husband, who frittered away taxes on his hobbies. Tomiko alleviated famine and restored war-ravaged shrines, temples, and imperial palaces. She even invested her own private fortune to help maintain a healthy relationship between the emperor and the shogunate. After her death, the shogunate continued to lose authority, which would eventually lead to the protracted chaos of the Warring States period. In our contemporary world of growing inequality, old men with obscene levels of wealth and a reflex aversion to taxation are willing to spend vast sums to buy political influence. In Japan, it could be argued that from the Meiji era onwards, the nation's culture and values have consistently served the vested interests of wealthy old men. In this context, what could be more evil than a young woman who raises taxes and uses them wisely, especially if she also happens to be a ruthless and savvy political operator. Our final sworn enemy of moral hygiene, Yodo Dono, who stands accused by history of destroying the shogunate succession founded by Toyotomi Hideyoshi. She was born around 1596, the eldest of three sisters. Their parents were Lord Azai Nagamasa and Lady Ichi, the sister of one of the most celebrated shoguns, Oda Nobunaga. The marriage was meant to be the basis of an alliance between Nobunaga and Nagamasa, who had many disagreements. In 1573, matters came to a head when Nobunaga laid siege, and with his castle in flames, Nagamasa committed suicide. Having sent his sister and her children to live with one of his close allies, Nobunaga was assassinated a short time later by one of his closest retainers. The power struggle to determine who would become the next shogun was won by Hideyoshi, a peasant son who had risen through the ranks to become one of Nobunaga's key generals. Hideyoshi's earlier efforts to make Yododono's beautiful mother his concubine had been frustrated, but now it became impossible for her to resist the same fate. At 27, she was Hideyoshi's junior by 32 years. When she gave birth to her son Hideori in 1593, speculation mounted that it couldn't possibly be the child of the aging shogun, a rumor that has persisted for 400 years. Five years later, Hideyoshi died at the age of 62, and Hideori succeeded him with his mother in the now familiar role of regent. Tokugawa Ieyasu used his military power to establish a rival shogunate based in present-day Tokyo, which resulted in an attack on Hideori's Osaka castle stronghold when Ieyasu's demands for a pledge allegiance were rebuffed. Popular myth has it that Yododono was responsible for a sudden and unwarranted surrender. As one of the few, perhaps the only person on that day to have already survived two previous sieges that claimed the lives of close family members and narrowly escaped the raging inferno of a burning castle, it would be perfectly understandable if Yododono had lost her nerve. Clearly uncomfortable with the surrender that left a rival claim to power unextinguished, Ieyasu was back within a year, Osaka Castle was once more engulfed in flames, and like her parents, Yododono and her son committed suicide. The Edo period takes its name from Ieyasu's relocation of the national capital to his home region, where he had maximum support. Although the idea that Yododono was weak, selfish, greedy, jealous, and above all hysterical was almost certainly a useful bit of propaganda that served the interests of Ieyasu, after the restoration of the emperor that ushered in the Meiji era, this cautionary tale of a weak and hysterical woman continued to be refined and deployed to sway public sentiment. Despite lacking the cunning and ruthless ambition of her counterparts, Yorodono is condemned as a useful representation of the evil that comes from weak and hysterical women meddling in the affairs of great men. Compared to other modern advanced economies, Japan has a distinct shortage of evil females. The number of prominent outspoken women in both politics and business is ridiculously small. 
A number of prominent domestic scholars suggest that this places disproportionate pressure on men to sustain the role of sole breadwinner, which perhaps plays a role in declining rates of marriage and childbirth. This suggests a gender gap with deep historical roots is not to anyone's advantage, except perhaps for the vested interests in a few, especially wrinkled male hands. There is a concerted effort in the media and across wider culture to preserve a fantasy image of Japanese womanhood, an almost subliminal but ever-present pressure for women to live up to the ideals of delicacy, submissiveness, obedience, and quiet tolerance of wayward masculinity. But there are hopeful signs from young Japanese who, like their peers in so many other parts of the world, know that they are unlikely to enjoy many of the things taken for granted by their parents. And despite so-called cultural and language barriers, they are very much part of the global reassessment of values that is blossoming across social media. They are beginning to abandon the uniquely Japanese obsession with harmony that gave rise to a form of conversational whitewashing, or tatemai, and slowly beginning to adopt a more direct way of speaking. What social convention has always insisted is the very ugly truth of honne has become more attractive and not an automatic indicator of evil intent. When social convention stands in the way of resolving urgent social, economic and environmental issues, the positive benefits of avoiding uncomfortable topics becomes cancerous. Perhaps what Japan's stagnating social, political and economic establishment so desperately needs right now are a few more bad girls, outspoken women who can offer a fresh perspective and a new way of looking at decades-old issues. At the very least, it would be nice to agree a harmonious consensus around what constitutes an evil act and apply it equally to both men and women. If you'd like to know more about Tatemai and Honne in a future episode, let us know in the comments. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you'd like to join our next deep dive into evil territory.